Um, just a little, it is recording. <laughs> so um, John and I, we've been working on Kelowna Ware um, in the low country, specifically the Charleston area for a few years now. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know or isn't as familiar, Kelowna Ware is a locally made, low fired, uh, handmade earthenware that was made by enslaved Africans, free and enslaved indigenous people, and used by those groups uh, beginning in the colonial period and lasting until the first few decades of the 19th century. And as John and I began to approach Kelowna Ware, we did so with this broad goal of wanting to find ways to characterize the variation that we see in low country Kelowna Ware assemblages. For myself, I work with the legacy collection at Drayton Hall, like Chris said, and that's really where I began my education on Kelowna Ware. And right off the bat, I was struck by just the expansive spectrum of the different forms, the surface treatments, room decorations, uh, you, you name it. And um, that was all just coming from one excavation project at Drayton Hall. Um, and then I began to work with John and in the process of reaching out to other institutions and researchers, I realized that that kind of rule of diversity was not just at Drayton Hall, it was kind of everywhere. So in order to get a better handle on this, we hosted a workshop, gosh, it was like a couple of Julys ago, it was like two years ago, um, for anyone working on Kelowna Ware in the Carolinas. And this workshop allowed for us to begin a conversation around our goals of Kelowna Ware research, but then also some really fundamental questions like, what is Kelowna Ware? Um, it's not everyone agrees. So uh, in addition, John and I also hosted a symposium in October during which archeologists presented on recent Kelowna Ware research. And we had an amazing discussion around these projects and the future approaches to these studies. So today we wanted to share an overview of how we're approaching Kelowna Ware and then also some of the, the specific projects that we've undertaken. Um, First, I'm gonna give you guys a little background. So, um, Ivor Noel Hume, an archeologist, originally coined this ware type in Virginia as Colono Indian ware. Uh, that was to represent the likely manufacturing of these pots in that region by indigenous people. And it wasn't until researchers in South Carolina began to investigate Colono ware assemblages in that state that they realized that there was a significant difference with South Carolina Kelowna ware versus Virginia. In South Carolina, Kelowna ware was mostly being recovered from sites associated with enslaved Africans and African American communities, indicating that it wasn't just indigenous groups who were likely making and using this pottery. And so Leland Ferguson, who's a South Carolina archeologist proposed renaming this ware from Noel Hume's Kelowna Indian to what we call today Kelowna ware, or depending on where you're from, some people call it Kelowna ware, uh, in order to remove any ethnic affiliation. And it's worth noting that we still see significant differences in Kelowna ware from Virginia and South Carolina. Many have attributed this to the historical differences in plantation and farmstead systems between these two regions, and particularly in South Carolina, the large reliance of those rice plantations on enslaved African labor. So over the decades, Kelowna Ware research has focused on a lot of big question topics, um, one of which you've probably guessed is who is making this pottery. Many projects focus on or have focused on connecting uh, pottery making techniques or decorative choices to pre-colonial traditions in West Africa and North America. Ware types, so typology, was created to try and group attributes commonly seen together. And these types um, have attempted to assign at times ethnic affiliation of the potter or how the pot was used. In recent years, there's been a, a shift away from prioritizing the search for ethnic identity of the potter because it kind of leads to a focus on continuities between Kelowna ware and pre-colonial pottery made by West Africans and indigenous Americans. 
Um, in relation to clonoware and African diasporic studies, Dr. Teresa Singleton has really cautioned against this search for what has been called Africanisms, uh, which really describes physical objects or evidence that are interpreted as having direct African heritage. So she and other archaeologists have led this movement away from focusing on Africanisms because this not only overgeneralizes the experiences of enslaved Africans and their descendants, but it also lumps all the cultures within the African diaspora, which of course we know is incredibly varied and dynamic, um, and it's not exclusively linked to slavery. And it, Africanisms can ignore everything before that period as well as after. So with this, archaeologists have moved away from trying to identify ethnicity um, with each pot and have begun to instead look at identity more so in terms of how individuals, households, communities were affected by the systems of colonialism. Um, and then, of course, how that physically manifests in the production and use of colonialware. Um, aside from who made the pots, archaeologists have also analyzed potential reasons for production and use, particularly the potential role that colonialware had in regional markets in the Charleston area. So these studies also include looking at production at the household level and then also possible specialization of this craft within the context of plantation culture and the task system. Um, over uh, other research over the years has focused on pottery production as symbolic, whether as a coping mechanism or a form of resistance during slavery and reconstruction. Um, there was and, and still is a pretty large debate around the recovery of marked colonial vessels exhibiting either an impressed raised or incised X. Hindsight 2020, I should have included a photo up here, um, but Leland Ferguson, that archeologist from South Carolina I mentioned earlier, he initially reported on an assemblage of diver collected vessels recovered from waterways around Charleston. And he connected the marked X to a West African religious symbol, what's known as the Bakongo Cosmogram. So this debate, <laughs> is very intense and complex and it would take, I could do a whole presentation on it probably, and then more so, but um, I'll just summarize it briefly by saying that many argue for the significance of these motifs and their possible connection to both West African ideology and the identities of the potters in the low country. Um, and then that while it's difficult to assign, we can't ignore possible religious meaning of colonial wear. On the other side of the aisle, um, folks argue that the use of marked vessels without reliable context is alone problematic. Um, and that in addition, these connections are akin to searching for Africanisms and are thus very overly simplistic, one-to-one -one interpretations that might not be entirely accurate. Uh, there are of course, plenty of people in the middle ground of this debate. Um, and while this began back in the 90s, discussion is still very much going on today. More recently, archaeologists have begun to look towards any possible relation to descendant communities in the low country. So the Gullah Geechee community, which is sometimes broken into Gullah for the Carolinas and Geechee for Georgia and Florida, uh, from a linguistic standpoint, I've heard Gullah described as the more traditional language, whereas Geechee is more modern. Uh, but the Gullah Geechee community identifies as the descendants of the enslaved West Africans who were brought to the Low Country in the Southeast Coast in the late 17th and 18th centuries to work on the plantations, most of which produced rice. This community is well known today for its distinct cultural traits, particularly its language, foodways, crafts. If anyone's been to Charleston, I'm sure you've seen the basket making um, all over downtown as well as uh, in the surrounding areas. So while anthropologists, linguists, and other disciplines have been interested in different aspects of Gullah Geechee culture for a while, archeologists have really only more recently, uh, relative to these other disciplines, 
looked at material traces, traces of their architecture, um, and, as well as use of landscape and craft production. So that said, archaeologists have cautioned, and particularly with Kelowna Ware, against general, generalizing within the Gullah Geechee community, arguing for the need for very large and diverse collections of resources in order to reflect the large diversity we see in the Gullah Geechee historical experiences, as well as their reactions to modern research. And many of these same archaeologists have looked at the diversity of local indigenous groups as well around Charleston and the importance of a potential colonial wear connection to these communities, but at the same time, recognizing the diversity within these communities, as well as the many types of changes and negotiations they undertook as a direct result of colonialism, um, such as coalescence. This is all to say that colonial wear should not be taken for granted as the direct link to the cultures and identities of, the, of these descendant groups in the Low Country, as their meaning has undoubtedly changed. So, with all these points in mind, much of Clonaware research in the Low Country has moved towards looking at how the effects of colonialism has changed the lives, the communities, their practices um, of those making and using this pottery. For example, archaeologists have directed attention to changes or consistencies in foodways particularly the introduction of new cooking methods and cooking materials, and then of course, how that's reflected in pottery production. Um, also the consideration for the mechanisms of slavery and the demands and allowances of the task system have led to reanalyzing colonial wear as evidence of labor demands. In addition, how have these systems changed and manifested in pottery production post-emancipation and during reconstruction. So that was a, a bit of a lit review, but with all those considerations in mind and to help us more accurately understand the choices made by those making and using colonial wear, uh, John and I uh, took and take a Shen Operatoire approach to this work. So Shen Operatoire, chain of operations, uh, simply reflects the steps taken to create something. So we use this to track the order of decisions in colonial wear manufacturing. And of course, this first includes the acquisition of raw materials, um, as well as um, the temper added to the raw clay in order to hold it together. I kind of like to think of it as eggs and baking and holds kind of that raw base together. Um, and then the choice of how they're going to build the pots. Uh, for example, John will show later that a lot of the pots uh, were made by coiling or hand modeling. So there's different ways that we can look at that, those choices that are made. Uh, and of course, the form that the potter made the vessel into, bowl, jar, um, the decoration. And I should say decoration can be applied or surface treatment can be applied before firing, but also after, like with painted catawba bowls that would have been painted after the firing process. And then the firing process itself, um, how hot was, were they able to get the fire? What sort of materials are gonna impact the resulting vessel? How close the pots are to the fire, things like that are going to impact how oxidized or reduced the paste gets, um, as well as how dense or, or porous the vessel is, the vessel paste. Um, and then finally, how the vessel was both intended to be used and then how it was used and any sort of uh, post-production impacts like utensil marks, things like that. Um, so when gathering all of our attribute data, we use this as a guide in order to better characterize the physical attributes of Kelowna wear and subsequently the intentions and possible meanings behind those choices. So a good example of how we applied this approach um, is our research on three vessels from around Charleston uh, that were decorated with a West African style roulette. So we have nine shirts from Drayton Hall. You can see them on the top right. We have, um, and of course, Drayton Hall is a historic plantation, uh, as Chris said, on the Ashley River. Four shirts were found at the Hayward Washington House. This is downtown Charleston. 
And those are on the bottom right. Um, although I apologize, they're kind of cut off. I should have fixed that. And then one partially complete vessel on display at the Horry County Museum. Um, so all of these vessels and shirts were reanalyzed and found to have been decorated what is, with what is called a folded strip roulette. A roulette in general can be a t uh, really any tool that's simply rolled across the surface of a vessel to create a repeating pattern. Um, a folded strip roulette involves using at least two strips of vegetal material and twisting and folding them around one another, kind of like a lanyard. And I've got a picture coming up next. Um, and then when this is rolled across a vessel, this will create the diamond-like shapes and relief that you can see on the screen. Folded strip rouletting is really unlike any pottery decorating tradition found in Southeastern indigenous communities, uh, but it has been used in parts of West Africa for thousands of years. And John will talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, but I wanted to talk uh, briefly about the roulette. So although we have read about full district rouletting from African ethnographic and archeological studies, we wanted to test this theory and also, again, get, get a sense of the choices that were being made and the actual practices of making and using a roulette. So we made one. <laughs> um, and uh, we the one that, we made was actually used with palm fronds from just outside the office. That's what you see on the screen. And not only did we achieve a nearly identical impression, you can see the experimented impression on the bottom left in modeling clay, uh, but we also gained a bit more understanding of the materials needed to make a roulette. And we did a bit of research into different grass and palm varieties in the region. And we also learned that the skill is very easily transmissible. We were able to pick it up from just the descriptions provided in the ethnographies, um, and uh, as well as some archeological research done in West Africa. And that research showed that this technique spread really easily and rapidly throughout the region. Um, before I toss it to John, I just wanna say that in this experimentation, we were able to learn even such nuanced things about uh, the different appearances you can get from, for example, how dry the palm was when you twisted it. Um, if you twisted it while it was a fresh palm and then it shrunk and dried overnight. Um, and that experimentation uh, was able to show us that actually each of the three vessels that we were looking at was made with like a slightly different set of choices. So even as detailed as that, we were able to get. so. Um, I'm going to toss it to John here to get, give a bit more insight into roulette history and variation in Western and Central Africa. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> I should start by saying, too, that um, this surface treatment, a lot of folks will continue to argue with us that it's not rouletting and it might be a different form, like something called net impressing or or some such that Native Americans were making. And while we acknowledge it's a very similar surface treatment, uh, it, the replication experiments we did uh, pretty much demonstrate, I think beyond the shadow of a doubt that this was made through the method that we're talking about. But we can, if folks have questions about it, we can talk about it later. Um, so we were lucky when all of this happened and I should say it all happened very serendipitously. Uh, Martha Zierden at the museum, uh, Charleston Museum, just emailed me one day with the, a picture pretty much like the one you see on the screen and said, hey, have you ever seen this before? And I said, no, it looks like net impressing. Uh, I emailed Corey. Corey said, we have stuff that looks like that at, at Drayton Hall, but I always thought it was net impressing. And I started looking at net impress shirts from North Carolina, where it's a pretty common surface treatment. Um, but it didn't look quite the same. And then I forgot about the whole deal. And uh, a few months later, I just so happened to be reading uh, a book called like African Rouletting that had come out uh, just a couple of years earlier and saw a picture that looked just like what we had. And so that's what sort of inspired us to start the replicative experiments. Anyway, that book represents a lot of recent research that our colleagues in Africa, mostly um, students of uh, Paul Gosselin, who's, that's where chain apatoire comes from, the French term. Uh, 
It's this belief of studying uh, objects to sort of decipher the practices that led to the creation of that object, and then using that to get at, you know, ways of, of thinking and being that are passed down from one generation to another. So basically finding the culture in objects. Those folks had been looking at pottery in West and Central Africa, and their research really is what I'm just sort of in, distilling in just a tiny uh, a tiny little snippet here for the next couple minutes. It turns out that rouletting in general, which is taking a, it can be like what we, we found the, str the strip, the folded strip roulette. It could be a, a carved wooden cylinder. Anything that you roll over the surface, the wet surface of a vessel before firing is called rouletting. And it turns out that rouletting is found in contexts as far back as 2000 BC. And it looks like the earliest rouletting in, in Africa started sort of in the Mali, uh, Niger area and spread eastward over the next 4,000 years. And then zooming in the map that we're showing here is specifically the type of rouletting that we found, which is the folded strip rouletting, both research into archeological collections as well as ethnographic because this method of decoration actually continues to be used today shows a similar uh, spread, a uh, pattern of spread beginning somewhere again in that sort of Mali, Mauritania, Senegal area in West Africa, spreading east to the Lake Chad area by uh, roughly about 1000 AD, and then as far east as central and southern Sudan by the 19th century AD. So just a, you know, a couple hundred years ago, and again, continuing um, to this day. Now, what's interesting in terms of what we found is we were able to identify in the literature a couple of recent archaeological uh, reports that talk about sites that date to the same time period. So we're thinking that these the context that these sherds here in South Carolina were found is somewhere in the mid 18th century. And so looking to Africa, there are a couple candidates, and of course we're not making a one-to-one -one comparison, but these are just suggestions of places where this potting tradition was pretty common. And so the potter who made the pots that we're finding here in South Carolina may have been a member of a community in one of these areas. So that's sort of a preface. Uh, the first area is, sort of in between, if you look at the map, in between Nigeria and Chad, you'll see there's a couple of overlapping circles. That sort of, yeah, that kind of diagonally placed light gray circle there is one of the areas where the folded strip roulette is pretty common. And that's actually part of what was known as the Kanem-Borno Empire. These are Kanuri speaking African folks who were actually really prominent in the slave trade during the, the 17th well, all the way to 16th through the 19th centuries. Uh, the other site where this uh, pottery is really common is the, the site of Kano, uh, which is about 400 miles to the northwest on the Niger River, which is in between Nigeria and Niger up there. Um, that is a different cultural group. These are Hausa speaking folks. And again, it was part of a city-state, the Kano city-state, who again were pretty prolific um, in traders of enslaved peoples. These were um, Arabic empires uh, that were part of that sort of Arabic diaspora during the, the Middle Ages, um, which of course ended when the Portuguese show up and all that stuff. Um, so again, we're not trying to definitively say that kind of, you know, that that's where people are from. What we're doing, though, is we are opening up the notion that we might be able to start thinking about this. And I think it actually raises some really important questions that folks that, that don't necessarily agree with Corey and I raise, which I think are very valid. The number one question is, why is this so rare, right? Why in the however many years of study of Kelowna where have we only come across this many vessels? And I would argue that there's probably some more out there. It's just people have misidentified it as net impressed or, or some other kind of pottery. But I don't think it's it's terribly common regardless. So why is it so rare? Is it it was was it a special thing that people sort of you know used secretly on the household level? Was it something that someone practiced because they may have just come over and been brought over, enslaved and brought over from Africa, and that 
that sort of treatment was quickly lost because of you know being enslaved or pressured to not do it. We don't know, uh, but that's part of the sort of question. That's what's interesting about this is this is really not a definitive statement about connections to Africa. It more speaks to new questions about what happened to folks once they got here. It's part of that process of colonialism, right? Um, so I guess we can segue there into the next slide, which gets into uh, the more recent work that Corey and I have been undertaking. And this is a more general analysis of colonial wear. Just like Corey said at the beginning of her talk, we look at pot this pottery as a sort of material like outcome, like a material uh, piece of evidence that really is about culture and about the way people live their lives. And it's so it's a very peculiar form or particular form of material culture in the Charleston area that dates to colonialism. This kind of pottery did not exist before Charlestown was founded. And this kind of pottery exists in a few other places, but it really is concentrated in Charleston. So I think that begs sort of further analysis. It also, we suspect, was made predominantly by people who were part of the colonial project, uh, primarily enslaved Africans and Native Americans, right? So these are folks whose, whose lives don't really appear in the written record a whole lot. So as archaeologists, if we want to study the effects of colonialism or the participation of groups who aren't in the record, written record in colonialism, material culture is the way that we do that. And I think clone aware, because it's part of the daily lives of these individuals, it really is a fundamental part of, of who they are. So uh, with that in mind, we look at colonialism basically as this historical force that caused major disjunctions in the lives of people. And this is true of all those involved in colonialism. European folks are moving over here from Europe. They're giving up you know, the known sort of lives that they had and starting new ones. Enslaved Africans obviously are enslaved and ripped from their culture, brought here and forced to work under violent and oppressive conditions. Native Americans were here and now are dealing with interacting with these two new groups. Sometimes they are being enslaved and enduring the same lives that the enslaved Africans are. Those who weren't enslaved and were free were trading. We're also though dealing with all sorts of disruptions. While those disruptions are happening, they're also in their sort of a negative aspect of taking things away from their culture. Also in dealing with those disruptions, all three groups are creating new ways of living, right? And coping with this. They're creating new ways of hunting, of, of eating, of making buildings, of dressing even. And so pottery is part of that. It's part of food ways. So it's part of how they ate and, and sort of every day. And so we can look at that to think about how society sort of developed here in South Carolina of the kind of compromises people made of the new things they invented of maybe resistance to things for those who are enslaved. So there's a lot we can tell, um, but how do we do this? Pottery, if you've seen the pictures, Colonial War is beautiful, but it's kind of plain. There's not, you know, at first glance, how do you answer questions about people's lives based on a bowl or a jar? And that's where the chain operatoire idea that Corey was talking about comes up, that we sort of investigate objects as the result of actions and that those actions are cultural. They're learned, right? I, if I'm a potter, I make a pot based primarily on the way I was taught to make a pot by my mom or my dad. And so we can break down an object into the series of choices that a potter made to arrive at that pot and then start to look and see if we identify patterns, right? This is, if you think about if colonialism is mashing people together, in this case forced, if there's enslaved Native Americans and Africans and they're being forced to live together, they're probably bringing very different ways of doing things together. And that may actually materialize itself in things like pottery or in architecture. So by breaking down these objects that seemingly look the same, maybe we can identify that variability. And so maybe it's there is no variability and everybody's making pottery the same way. 
that would be really cool. Uh, that wasn't what we expected. That would suggest either this was a, an agreed upon brand new thing that popped up out of nowhere among the people making pottery. But if there is variability or variation, is it the kind of blending that suggests that there were people bringing different ways of doing things together? And spoiler alert, that's sort of what we found. Um, now, in order to sort of just or sort of set up this study, the way that we wanted to think about it is if, if colonialism is the force creating all this stuff, let's look at pottery before Europeans and enslaved Africans were in the, uh, in, in the low country, so pre-colonial sites. Let's compare the way pots were made then to way, the way pots were made shortly after the founding of Charlestown. So we collected pottery from these sites that you see on the map. We have two sites that represent Native American communities prior to the arrival of Europeans and enslaved Africans. That's the Daniel Island site, which just predates uh, when Charlestown Landing was founded. And then we have pottery that's a few centuries earlier. That's the Charlestown Landing site. It's a pre-colonial component that's actually at where Charlestown Landing uh, was, was, was founded. Then we have collections from a number of late 17th and early 18th century sites from all across uh, the Low Country. Uh, we have Ashley Hall, which was where one of the early governors of South Carolina lived. We have the Parsonage, which was St. Paul's Parish that was burned during the Embassy War. And then we have two sites that were essentially trading posts, the Ponds, which was Andrew Percival's uh, plantation, and then the little bit earlier date, we have Lord Ashley's scenery, which was known as St. Giles Cuso. And so we figure that by comparing colonial ware from those two different time periods, or, or by colonial ware, I mean all pottery, low-fired, handmade earthenware, we can identify, is there a disjuncture? And then what does that look like? So next slide. Here's where things get really nerdy. So in order to break down these choices, we have to think as archaeologists, well, how do we measure things? Like, how do I, how can I tell that a potter did one thing or another? And so we chose a number of different variables or dimensions or choices to look at. The first was what kind of clay did they choose? And either did they, it's clay source or adding this stuff called temper that Corey talked about. Um, oftentimes potters will add a a plastic, like an unbendable or expandable material to clay to help when the clay, when the vessel is drying, it can expand and contract and we don't want it to crack. So they add things like sand, crushed muscle shell, et cetera. So the first choice we looked at is what kind of temper was added or in the case of most of the pottery here is tempered with, with sand. Was it naturally occurring in the clay? If so, was it chunky or was it fine? That's basically what we looked at. Uh, we also looked at the technique, the forming technique. So did they make the pot based on coils, like the old snake, you know, like you made in, in sort of uh, elementary his, uh, art class? Or did they make it by taking a big mound of clay and forming it, or maybe even smushing clay on top of a mold? Like you take a bowl and turn it upside down and make a, a, a form it that way. The vessel form, jars, bowls, etc. what kind of form did the vessels take? And then we looked at decoration as well. And we're breaking it down. So the first thing we did was look at that choice of clay and temper. Did they choose clay that had big chunks of sand or really fine sand? And the way to do this was using something called digital image analysis. So you take the pot shirt, and you basically, we took a Dremel. There's fancier ways of doing things, but I'm cheap and we wanted to do a lot of pottery. So you could do something called petrographic analysis, which would involve using a wet saw and a microscope and all this crazy stuff. I said, let's take a Dremel. We'll shave it nice and clean. We'll use a high resolution scan. So I forget what it was like 3000 digit dots per inch, something crazy like that. 6,000 dots per inch. Um, and then using Photoshop, we actually could do some sort of algorithmic transformations of, that sounded fancy, of the, uh, of the image to isolate the tempered particles and then measure them. So the next slide. That's what we see here is the transformation of a color image in the right side, or left side to on the right, that isolated image that just shows the tempered particles. 
uh, once we do that, Photoshop can actually isolate them and measure the width and the height of them. So we got about 1500 measurements uh, on each shirt. Now imagine trying to do that by hand, you, you can't. I mean, you can't, the calibers don't sort of work like that. And even in petrographic analysis, you're, you're sort of limited to the number of shirts you can kind of do that thin section to. So we have a much larger sample size than a, a typical sort of what's called petrographic analysis. So in here, we measured the size, the average size of the particle, and then also how much of that shirt face is taken up by temper. Like how, is there a lot of, of big chunky pieces or just a few chunky pieces, or is there a lot of fine pieces, et cetera? We were able to measure those things. Next slide. The other thing we looked at is you're able to actually transform the other way and look at the holes in the pottery or the voids, the air pockets in between the clay. And what's neat is in many cases, you can actually see patterning in those voids that suggest how that pot was made. So here we see in the first picture, we go from the scan to the isolated image to what appear to be these diagonal lines of holes, which are voids. And you can see a close up of one of those on the far right. This suggests a, a coiling technique. So what you have here above that line is one coil, beneath that line is another coil. And the way that the, the potter put them together was sort of at an angle. That's called end coiling. We were able to identify some additional types of coiling. So the next slide I think shows that. We have what's called S coiling, where you're alternating coils on the inside and the outside on the way up. You have U coiling, which is just directly vertically stacking the coils. And imagine the potter is coiling these, this pot, but then is also somehow smoothing those coils out, right? Um, and the final one is that completely different method known as modeling. And in this case, we think it's probably layers of clay that are added to a, over a mold. So either on the inside of a bowl or on the outside. And what you end up there with is instead of these um, sort of perpendicular void uh, patterns, there are void patterns that are parallel with the, the pot surface because you're laying uh, layers of clay down. Next slide. We also are able to look at the density and the shape even of the pores. And this deals with a couple of things. The first is if you don't, uh, clay around here has a lot of organic content, little bits of leaves and twigs, et cetera. And if you don't clean the clay, that stuff fires it. It sort of evaporates when you fire it and it leaves a void. You obviously want relatively pure clay, but that's not always possible. Uh, so uh, pots with lots of voids could either be pots that were made of clay that hadn't been cleaned very well. The other thing has to do with the forming technique. We think that pots were either made by hand, by hand modeling, like forming up using just your fingers, or the traditional Native American way is using a paddle with some form of anvil on the inside of the pot, either a, a stone or sometimes in some cultures they used actually a sort of mushroom shaped trowel made of pottery. And they'd hold the, the, the trowel on the inside of the pot and they would slap the outside. We think that that created a lot more compressive force. And so pots made with the paddle and anvil probably would have, we would expect them to have less dense um, or more, more pores. They would be less dense in terms of the number of woods. They'd have, they'd have pot, excuse me, paddle and anvil would have a lot less pores handmade pots would probably have a lot more pores. All right, next slide. So this is when we really get into the, the nerd weeds here. So I will be, I will remain as, as sort of up here as possible. So we actually compared me those measures across the sites using statistics. What you're looking at here is a graph. The first thing we looked at was the choice of clay. Did they choose pots with big chunks or clay with big chunks of sand, or did they add big chunks of sand to the clay, or did they choose clay that had fine sand particles, or did they add fine sand particles? One of those two things, chunky or fine. When we compare the assemblages from pre-colonial context, those are the ones on the left, the two sort of weird bow tie looking things, to all those other sites which are post-colonial, you can see what it's showing here is the average size of the particle. And that kind of bow tie where it pinches in is the, is the average. 
you can see that the average size of sand particles prior to colonialism is much higher than those after. What that suggests is that potters of pre-colonial communities are either choosing clay, particular sources of clay that have lots of chunky sand in it, or they're choosing to add sand that are in large pieces. Whereas those potters in sites after colonialism are either choosing uh, clay sources with fine sand or they're adding fine sand. So that's a big, pretty big difference right off the bat. Next slide. When we look at the voids, right, the, the amount of voids in the pots, again, we see a pretty major difference. Now, the reason that there are these little notches in those bow ties, that kind of V, what that V represents, essentially what you can think of it as, if those Vs don't overlap at all, that means that there is a, we're really sure that those are importantly different. It's called statistical significance. So we can say, statistically, we can be confident that the density of pores, meaning how many holes are in the pots after colonialism is much higher than before colonialism. Now, again, what does that suggest? Two things. First, either the, pot, the clay wasn't cleaned as well by potters after colonialism started, or that the forming techniques uh, were different probably more hand modeling and less paddle and anvil, which we'll have supporting uh, evidence of that in a second, maybe in our next slide. You can go to the next slide. Okay, it'll be the one after this. This looks at forming technique. So again, is it mass modeled or is it coiled? We looked at all the vessels that we had evidence that we could tell. And what you see here, again, the two sites on the bottom, the two sites on the left, Charlestown Landing and Daniel Island, those are sites that predate uh, the founding of Charlestown. So these are Native American communities prior to colonialism. We can see all of the pots are made by coiling. We can also see another thing that in those assemblages, jars tend to dominate the assemblage. So they're using mostly sort of large vessels, not that many bowls. Once we get colonialism represented by the pond site, Spencer site, Lord Ashley Parsonage and Ashley Hall, we start to see, well, in the first two sites, a mixture of jars and bowls. And then in the later ones, almost all bowls, hardly any jars. And the other thing is we start to see modeling and coiling use, right? So there's this expansion of the types uh, or of the methods, let's say of making pots. It's not just coiling anymore. It was exclusively coiling before, before colonialism, after we see a mixture being used by potters. Next slide. There we go, surface treatment. So again, the way that surface treatments, there's three major surface treatments in these assemblages. There's plain, which is sort of just smoothed. There's Burnished, which is taking a tool when the pot is almost dry, but before you fire it and taking some water and smoothing it to the point where it's almost shiny. And then there's a completely different uh, service treatment called stamping, which is taking a wooden paddle and carving it with designs and impressing it into the pot before you fire it. When we look at the distribution of those three decorations, what we see again is a major difference between pre-colonial and colonial. Pre-colonial sites, Charlestown Landing and Daniel Island are almost exclusively stamped, right? And they're almost exclusively jars. Uh, there are three bowls that we found at Daniel Island. None of those is stamped, right? So those are carved wooden paddles and pressed. Hardly any plain, hardly any burnished. When we look at our colonial samples, we see a huge change. Ponds and Spencer, especially the ponds, has a mixture of stamped, burnished, and plain vessels. The stamped ones are only jars, but there's a lot of bowls and they're plain and burnished. And the Spencer site has a couple of jars, predominantly bowls, mostly plain and, uh, and, and uh, plain and burnished. Those two sites are important, remember, because they're trading sites. So we actually would expect to find a lot of stamped pots at the ponds, for instance, because Native Americans, where that tradition comes from, 
are probably staying there for periods of time, or there may have been enslaved uh, Native Americans there as well. But if we look at the parsonage in Ashley Hall and Lord Ashley, we see there's, there's hardly any uh, stamp pottery. Next slide. So to sort of summarize, what, what does this all mean? Why, what, what, are, what are all these like nerdy graphs and, and what am I trying to show? Basically, what we find or what we were concluding is we can see these, this in a, in a sort of dichotomous way. There's like two things going on here. There's potting traditions before colonialism, and then there's what potters are doing after colonialism. So before Europeans show up and, bring, and they brought enslaved Africans, there was a very homogenous, similar potting style that actually is pretty common across much of the South Appalachian region, all the way up to where y'all are in Lancaster, all the way down to Northern Florida. It's what's known as the Lamar culture in, uh, in archeological parlance. This tradition is based on finding clay sources with chunky big pieces of sand well cleaned pottery, so taking the time to pick out all the organic material, building pots by coiling, not mass modeling, uh, using a paddle and an anvil, and the paddle we know because of the dominance of stamped, right? The stamped has to be a paddle. So paddle and anvil, they're mostly making jars and a few bowls. So that's sort of the pre-colonial tradition. Beginning in 60, as early as 1670, we see a massive shift in potting traditions practiced in the low country, right? That we see a major shift to potters choosing clay with much finer particles of sand or adding fine particles of sand. They're not cleaning the clay very well. That's why there's so many voids. They're probably, they're making things by coiling, but there's this new, this new forming technique that didn't exist before. This mass modeling becomes much more common. They're likely hand building the pots. They're not using paddle and anvil. And then we find these assemblages dominated mostly by bowls, uh, burnished and plain bowls, except for again, the pond site, which we know again was a, had a lot of resident trading Native Americans. So what does this mean? To us, we're basically saying it looks like this reflects diversity in potters, right? There's a diversity of potters because of colonialism. You have enslaved Native Americans, enslaved Africans. There may even be some European folks in the mix there. Each of them bringing their own notions about the ways that they learned how to make pots and what they think is the right way to make pots. So that may be one reason that we see this sort of diversity. Maybe the increase in the number of voids that we're seeing in pots and the use of mass modeling, it reflects the need to produce quickly lots of vessels because this is one of the most common forms of material culture you find on early colonial uh, sites, meaning that everyone's eating and cooking out of these vessels. Uh, white, black, Native American, everyone is. So whoever is making these vessels has to make a lot of them. And under the pressures and the violence of slavery, you're trying to make them as quickly as possible because you probably have other things to do. So you're not making them, you're not, you maybe can't take the time to clean the clay very well. You aren't coiling because it's easier just to make, you know, to, to mass model them. Maybe you're hand forming because there's not the time to use a paddle and anvil, or maybe you're not allowed to. We, we don't know those, the answer to those yet. And then lastly, there may be major, and there probably are, major changes in food ways that are occurring. There are certainly this almost disappearance of jars, uh, especially of the large jars that, that Native American communities prior to colonialism used. The disappearance of that likely has something to do with the use of alternative vessels for cooking, probably kettles, copper, uh, brass kettles, uh, cast iron kettles take on a much more uh, prominent role in colonial cuisines. The other thing though is the bowls, the interesting increase in bowls and also the size of bowls suggests something about the way that meals were shared. Or potentially the, the smaller, maybe the bowls use, uh, the bowls suggest smaller groups are participating rather than uh, eating out of a large jar, they're eating out of small bowls or potentially even individual servings, the notion of eating out of your own bowl or perhaps the use of, of different things 
prior to colonialism, maybe they're using more wooden uh, vessels to eat out of. Maybe we just we again these these are questions that beg further um, further study, and so seeing these changes makes us hopeful that this approach can be kind of replicated looking at other types of artifacts and other types of features. The, the idea that objects and features represent the outcome of practices or the outcome of action and that those actions are informed by the way you learn them. So they are physical manifestations of culture. So when we want to talk about things like identity and how did identity change, we have to look at the practices because that's and then the practice is what results in the forms that we look at. So things like cuisine, so looking at bones and looking at charred plant remains can start to get at questions of how did the food ways, and this is work that's already ongoing, how did those things change? We can look at things like, uh, like architecture, like the way that houses were built based on how we can reconstruct buildings based on the stains that are left in the soil. But all of these things are ways that we can create a better understanding, first of the fact that this is a shared history, that these identities are being created not separately among enslaved Africans, Native Americans, and Europeans, but these, are, these colonial identities are shared. They, they, they come out of the interaction among those three groups. And then also, I think, in sort of a broader picture way, we can really get a, a better understanding of how colonialism shaped the lives of folks back then, but even how colonialism continues to shape the lives of people living here in America today by taking that approach, by looking at what we surround ourselves with in terms of the built environment and also objects and thinking about the cultural practices that led to those, those things. So that's, that's my sort of bit. I don't know, Corey, if you wanted to say anything to conclude or not. Otherwise, I think we could take some questions. Well concluded. Thank you.